This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com and enter Paleo Analysis at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, Tim Tim, let's get the hell out of the Triassic. Yeah, probably a good idea. Okay. We've had like 1,400 people asking us when the next History of the Earth is coming out. It's been raining non-stop. The, the roads are really slick. Steve, wait. It's insane. Oh, God. Slow down. No! Okay. <laughs> Tim Tim, are you alright? <sighs> eh, he's fine. But I think we might be in a bit of trouble. <laughs> what happened? Well, I think we're stuck. Stuck? Steve, we've been stuck in the Triassic for the past nine months. It's been raining nonstop since November. What did we even hit? I don't know, but it doesn't look like we're getting out of here today. Luckily, there is something that we can do in the meantime. You see, one of the issues that I've run into doing the History of the Earth series is that there's so much that needs to be covered between climactic conditions, the geology, the flora, the fauna in both terrestrial and aquatic environments, and the new adaptations taking place. There's so much that goes into each one that I feel like a lot of the information gets missed. So, since we're going to be stuck here for a bit, this will give us the opportunity to get a little bit more in depth with a few of the different Triassic weirdos that, well, I know you all love so much. So we can think of this as kind of like a mini series within the series that you all keep asking me about. This is The History of the Earth, The Beasts of the Triassic. And I know just the creature to start this off. Okay. Well, while you do that, what should I do? Go find out what we hit, and start working on some sort of a base for us in case we're stuck here for a while. Aye, aye, Captain! Let's see, at the moment we are sitting at about 234 million years ago. During this time, the world was undergoing some very big changes from what had been established in the previous 18 million years of the Triassic period. As we said in the last History of the Earth, life had to slowly adapt to the hyper-arid conditions that turned most of Pangaea into a global desert. And because of this, many of the animals that did manage to survive the Permian extinction would eventually fall by the wayside. By far, the most dramatic decline was in a previously mentioned Dicynodont, Lystrosaurus, where in about a million years, it went from the most common form of animal life on land to completely extinct. It's thought that this was caused, at least in part, by the rise of new predators and competition that Lystrosaurus was not prepared to deal with. So, kind of like what happened to dodos on a grand supercontinent-wide scale. Most of these new threats were coming from a group of reptiles called archosaurs. And I really feel like this mini-series will give us a chance to fully appreciate the diversity and dominance that this group reached during the first period of the Mesozoic Era. This group would eventually take over the world. And today, I want to talk about one of the very first big archosaur success stories. This. Hyperodapodon. <laughs> now, the name Hyperodapodon actually refers to a genus rather than a single species, of which there were several distinct species within it. And even though it looks kind of like someone tried to crossbreed a bearded dragon and a naked mole rat, and then tried to burn it after realizing they made a horrible mistake, this creature is actually a member of the very successful family of archosaurs, known as the Rhynchosaurs. And although it was not the first family of archosaurs to see success in Pangaea, I would argue that they were the very first to have anything close to the overwhelming numbers to rival Lystrosaurus in the early Triassic. This came at a time in the mid-Triassic when the climate had shifted in a very significant way. The temperature still remained very hot as it did throughout the entire Triassic, but it went from extremely dry to very wet and humid. Now this in general might seem like a good thing. After all, water is essential to life. 
But when life on land had spent the past 18 million years adapting to a hot, dry, global ecosystem, a shift to the exact opposite was going to cause most of the specialized animals to die out. Now, Lystrosaurus itself was already long gone at this point, but other herbivores did die out at this time, and the Rhynchosaurs, like Hyperodapodon, quickly spread to take their place. And, with all the continents still together at this point, these fat little reptilian gophers were able to spread across the entire world. <laughs> The remains of Hyperodapodon have been found on every continent except for Australia and Antarctica, which at this point we actually don't have a lot of fossil evidence from the Triassic period on those two continents. So it doesn't actually mean that Hyperodapodon wasn't in those regions as well, it just means that we have not found the evidence to support it. So it's very likely that they were there too. Especially considering the most impressive part of this global distribution was what we see in the Southern Hemisphere in particular, where these animals were so abundant that they represent up to 80% of the fauna in the fossil layers from that time and region. Meaning that these guys were basically the Lystrosaurus of the Middle Triassic period. But why? Why, why this? From what we can tell from the fossils, the success of the Rhynchosaurs was tied to a specific event in the Triassic period, the Carnian Pluvial Episode, which lasted around 2 million years. This is what scientists refer to as that massive shift to more humid, rainy conditions all across the world. The world would be inherited by those who were able to adapt, and the Rhynchosaurs really were the true winners of this time. Its squat, low-to-the-ground body and barrel-shaped midsection held a large gut for digesting plants. And in addition to being able to burrow with its strong hind limbs, its body would also allow it to easily hide among the ferns to avoid predatory archosaurs, like the Pseudosuchians, that were only getting larger and more dominant as the Triassic went on. Their front teeth, which almost look rodent-like, probably served a very similar purpose in gnawing through roots, tubers, and woody vegetation. And that fat head was shaped that way to attach very large, powerful jaw muscles for chewing. Now, we actually have a few theories about what this animal would have looked like in life. It could have had exposed teeth, similar to a rodent, or it could have been covered by a beak made of keratin. Or the teeth could have possibly been covered by lips, making it look more like just a big-headed lizard in life. And we actually see a living example of a reptile with a very similar arrangement in the beak-like overbite of the Tuatara, another group of reptiles that got their start in the Triassic period. This actually led scientists to think for a while that these two were closely related. However, now it's generally believed that while the Tuatara is closer related to lizards and snakes, Rhynchosaurs are part of the Archosaur explosion that happened throughout the Triassic period, putting them closer related to dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilians than snakes and lizards. So these teeth are actually another case of convergent evolution, but it still could give us an idea of what it could have looked like as a living animal. It's ugly, but at least in the hot, humid, rainy forests of the Triassic, it apparently undeniably worked. <laughs> because for a time, these little gremlins were the most common animal on Earth. All right, Tim Tim, how goes the work? Have you built us a base? I'm working on it, and I found a fantastic tool to make that a reality. Squarespace, an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs and creators to stand out and succeed online. We've wanted to make a website for paleoanalysis for a long time. But if you don't already know how to code a website, it can be quite intimidating. And whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website. Just getting the ball rolling is easy, especially with the Squarespace blueprint options. 
With this, you go through a few steps where they ask you about different preferences, like picking through tons of different color palettes and fonts, along with different professionally curated layouts and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up. You have a ton of stock images to choose from, or you can upload your own. This service is tailored to your brand or business and optimized for every device, so you can easily launch your website and get discovered fast. And they integrate and optimize SEO tools, so you show up more often to more people and grow the way that you want. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, enter Paleo Analysis at checkout to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. One of the most helpful features starting out is the new Fluid Engine, also known as Squarespace 7.1. With this next generation website editor from Squarespace, it's never been easier for anyone to unlock unbreakable creativity. Choose your website starting point and customize every design detail with the reimagined drag and drop technology. Again, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the promo code PALEOANALYSIS at checkout to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, yeah, we'll definitely be working on that. But also, did you figure out what we hit? Well, when you started talking about Hyperodapodon, it gave me an idea. They're kind of like beaver lizards, right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, I figured that they could help clear out some of these plants. So they did. They, they did a pretty good job, too. But then I saw what we hit. And, well, we hit a wall. What? What do you mean we hit a wall? I mean, we hit a wall. That doesn't make any sense. Steve, we're in this situation because you crashed your Jeep into something while driving down the streets of the Triassic Permian jungle. None of this makes any sense! Look! Oh. So, we're stuck here until we hit 200,000 subscribers? That is the long and short of it, yes. Well then... Army of the Goo? Share the video, like, comment, everybody subscribe, join us so we can move forward, or else we'll be stuck here, among them. Have a good one, everybody.